Hey guys, let's continue with the form reflection model. And so uh, today we will focus on the diffuse component. We've already got uh, ambient light uh, working uh, in the previous uh, tutorial, which was uh, very simple. And the main difference between ambient and diffuse lighting is that the intensity of diffuse lighting depends on the direction of light. Ambient lighting is just a, a baseline lighting intensity, which is applied to every pixel regardless whether it is in light or shadow. Actually, the whole idea behind ambient lighting is that triangles that are facing away from the light will still be visible and not in uh, total darkness, including objects that are not in the direct path of the light. But when it comes to diffuse lighting, the intensity of the light is based on the way that the light meets the surface or the angle at the point where the light hits the surface. So before we dive deeper into this, I just want to say that in general, we have two categories of light sources that are relevant to diffuse lighting. We have a directional light and a point light. A directional light is a light source that we don't care about its exact location, only the direction. We have a light vector and that's it. Every triangle in the scene which is facing a directional light is hit by the same light vector. The classic example, and uh, some people may argue the only example, is of course the sun. The sun is located so far away that from the point of view of real-time rendering, the light rays emanating from the sun are all parallel to each other. So the location of the sun doesn't come into play in terms of uh, directional light calculations. The second category of diffuse light sources are man-made. So stuff like uh, street lights, uh, lamps, spotlights, etc. All these light sources are physically located within the 3D scene, so the direction of the light that hits an object depends on the vector that goes from the light source to the object, and that vector is actually different, not, ju not just for different objects, but also for different triangles within the same object, and perhaps even for different uh, pixels. And uh, we will see this later on. In this tutorial, we will focus on diffuse lighting that is originating from a directional light source, and uh, we will handle the other light sources in a future episode. Another difference between a directional light and a point light is that because the point light is artificial, it has a fall-off effect, okay? So the light intensity decreases as the object moves away from the light source. Makes sense, right? Whereas a directional light that is coming from the sun doesn't have a fall-off effect. So the light that hits the top of a tall building has the same intensity as the light that hits the street below. Okay, now that we understand the behavior of a directional light, let's talk about the object that is hit by the light. We said that we want a directional light to have maximum intensity when it hits the surface at a 90 degrees angle, and as the angle decreases, the intensity also proportionally decreases. When we get to an angle of zero, which basically means that the light vector is parallel to the surface, the surface doesn't receive uh, any light. If the angle is negative, it means that the light is hitting the back of the surface, so obviously there is no light in this case as well. This means that we need to calculate some kind of a factor, let's call it the diffuse factor, which will modulate the diffuse light intensity based on the angle at which the light hits the surface. Fortunately for us, the solution came out about uh, 260 years ago, and the credit goes to Johann Heinrich Lambert, who was a Swiss polymath, and in uh, 1760 he defined the Lambert's cosine law, which, uh, and let me quote from Wikipedia, Lambert's cosine law says, that the radiant intensity or luminous intensity observed from an ideal diffusely reflecting surface or ideal diffuse radiator is directionally proportional to the cosine of the angle theta between the direction of the incident light and the surface normal. Okay, so let's break it down. An ideal diffusely reflecting surface means a surface which is maté. So the surface looks the same regardless the location of the viewer. In other words, it means that the surface doesn't appear to shine when you look at it from uh, specific locations. In that case, the light intensity is directly proportional to the cosine of the angle theta 
between the light vector and the surface normal. By the way, this uh, shininess belongs to the department of uh, specular lighting, which we will of course cover in a future video. In case you're not familiar with the surface normals, this is simply a vector which is perpendicular to the surface, okay? So we have a 90 degrees angle between this vector and any other vector that starts and ends on the surface. A surface actually has two sides, so there are also two normal vectors. In our case, we're going to use the normal vector that is coming out of the side of the triangle that can be seen. In the past, we talked about backface culling, so the relevant triangle is the one which is not culled away. Basically, the triangles that create the exterior of objects and meshes. In the context of 3D rendering, the core building block is actually a triangle and not a geometric surface. So calculating the surface normal is just a matter of calculating the cross product of two edges of the triangle because the result of the cross product operation is a vector which is perpendicular to both input vectors. In order to calculate the cosine of the angle theta between the light direction and the normal, we will reverse the direction of the light vector and calculate the dot product of the reversed light direction and the triangle normal. In general, the result of the dot product is the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. In our implementation, we're going to normalize the two vectors, which means that we can get the cosine of theta by a simple dot product of the two vectors. The reason that we reverse the light direction is that it works well with the fact that the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of 90 is uh, zero. So if the light is perpendicular to the surface, when we reverse it, we get that theta is zero. So the diffuse factor is one, which is the maximum. When the light is parallel to the surface, the cosine of theta becomes zero, so no light at all. And uh, when theta is greater than 90 degrees, the cosine is negative. So we assume no light in, the, in this case because the light hits the back of the surface. Between zero and 90 degrees, we get some amount of diffuse lighting. Okay, are we done? No, not yet. If we go with the standard definition of a surface normal, the result will be that the diffuse lighting effect at each pixel in a single triangle is going to be the same. This means that we have the same illumination across the entire triangle face. As you can see in the following example, it doesn't look too good. We expect to see a, a gradual decrease of uh, light as the side of the box turns away from the light, but we can, can't achieve that when we have just a single normal for each side of the box. Therefore, the solution is to replace the triangle normal with a vertex normal. A vertex normal is the average of all the normals of the triangles that share that vertex. If we attach a vertex normal as a new vertex attribute and let the rasterizer interpolate it across the triangle face, we will get a slightly different normal per pixel. Okay, so pixels in the middle of the triangle will get a normal which is roughly the average of the three vertex normals and the pixels that are very close to a certain vertex will get a normal which is close to the normal of that vertex. This way we will get a different diffuse factor at each pixel which will provide the gradual transition that we can see in the following example. Okay, are we done? No. We still have one more thing to worry about. You see, the vertex normals are based on the position of the vertices in the local coordinate space. They are loaded into the GPU buffer and from now on, they don't change. Same as the other attributes. But during runtime, we perform various uh, transformations from uh, local to world space that can potentially change the orientation of the object towards the light. If we implement diffuse lighting based on just the knowledge that we have covered so far, the result will look like this. It appears that the light is rotating around the object where in fact, the light is stationary. It is actually coming in from the left and only the object should be rotating. The problem of course, is that the vertex positions are transformed from local towards space. But if we leave the normal as is, 
it is no longer valid for the, for the word location of the triangle. Therefore, the solution is to transform the normal to world space so that it will match the orientation of the triangle in the world space. Now, most tutorials use this solution, including even my own tutorial at uh, ogldev.org. This solution basically requires an additional matrix vertex multiplication in the vertex shader. But when you think about it for a bit, this multiplication can actually be avoided. Instead of transforming the normal into, into world space so that we can do a dot product between it and the light direction, which obviously is defined in world space, we can transform the light vector into the local space of the object and do the dot product in local space with the original normal. So we have replaced the matrix vertex multiplication per vertex with a single transformation per draw call. Obviously, this is more efficient. So how do we perform this uh, world to local transformation? Let's uh, think about it. Translation doesn't affect the normal vector. If the object moves around, the normal remains the same because in general, a vector has a direction and a length. And since it doesn't have a starting position, we can ignore translation and simply assume that all vectors start from the origin. Rotation obviously affects the normal vector, so we will need to take care of that. What about scaling? Well, if we stick with uniform scaling, the normal vector will be unaffected. But if we do non-uniform scaling, as you can see in the following example, the normal vector is uh, skewed in this case. The bottom line is that in order to transform from world space to local space, we need to inverse the local to world matrix. We don't care about translation, so we can focus simply on the top left 3x3 three three matrix. If we stick to uniform scaling, then that sub matrix is going to be orthogonal, uh, so we can just transpose it to get its inverse. If we really need to do non-uniform scaling, we will need to actually inverse the matrix, which is a bit more complex, but you know, not the end of the world. In this tutorial, we're going to limit ourselves to uniform scaling, which will allow us to inverse using a simple transpose. So now that we have all the tools, let's see how to actually put this knowledge into practice. <laughs> what a mess. First, let's add a diffuse component to the material class in ogldev slash include slash ogldev underscore material dot h. This is a vector of three floats, same as the ambient component. SIMP has a diffuse component in its material structure, and in the case of OBJ files, we have a matching entry in the material file called uh, KD, so we can manually manipulate it from there. Now, let's load this diffuse component in the function init materials of the base mesh class. As you can see, this code is identical to the ambient component. We just need to use the macro AI mat key color diffuse in the first parameter of the get function and copy the result of the diffuse component of the material. That's it. Now let's add a class to represent the directional light. This class inherits from the existing uh, base light class. So basically all the light sources that we're going to create will get their color from the base light class and we will be able to control their ambient intensity. The directional light class has two public attributes that we can directly manipulate, a direction vector in world space and a diffuse intensity, which works in the same way as the ambient intensity. As I've mentioned, it makes much more sense to specify the direction of light in world space and transform it to local space for each mesh that is being rendered. Therefore, we've also got a private variable for the direction in the local coordinate space. We want this class to calculate the local direction from the world direction, so we want to prevent the user of this class from accidentally manipulating it. We only provide a getter function, as well as a function called calc local direction that does exactly that. It calculates the local direction based on the world transformation matrix, which must be provided as a parameter. Now let's take a look at the implementation of this function in the corresponding CPP file. We start 
by initializing a 3 by 3 matrix using the top left corner of the world matrix, which is what this constructor does. We only need this part of the world matrix because translation doesn't affect the direction vector, and we assume that we are only using uniform scaling. Now, we need the inverse of this matrix. Okay, we have a local to world matrix and we want world to local, but because of uniform scaling, it is enough to transpose the matrix to get the inverse. Next, we multiply this uh, world to local matrix by the direction vector to do the transformation from uh, world space to local space, and we initialize the private variable using the result. Finally, we normalize the local direction so that the dot product between the direction and the normal vector will provide the cosine of theta. Now let's go back to the header file of this class and you can see that the set light function now takes a directional light class instead of a base light and we've got a bunch of uniform locations that we're going to need for the shader. A diffuse color for the material, the direction vector and the diffuse intensity. Back to the CPP file, we can see that we're getting these locations as usual. We can also see that when we set the directional light parameters into the shader, we use the local direction that we've just calculated. Don't make the mistake of sending in the world direction, it, it won't work. Finally, when we set the material into the shader, we also update the diffuse color, same as the ambient color. Now let's compare the vertex shader from the previous tutorial with the current one. We have the old one on the left and the new one on the right. As you can see, we have a new input attribute for the vertex normal, we define a corresponding output variable, and we just need to uh, copy the input into the output. No transformations are required because of the trick of doing the calculations in local space. Remember that a couple of episodes back, we learned how to load models using SMP, and initializing the buffer for the normals was already done there. So this attribute has been ready for us since then. We just didn't use it when we implemented ambient lighting. Now let's take a look at the fragment shader. And uh, this is where most of the fun takes place. First, we have the normal vector as input. We also have the directional light structure, which combines the base light and the directional light C++ classes. In the material, we have a diffuse color along with the ambient color. In the main function, we do some initial calculations of the ambient and diffuse colors separately. The ambient color is calculated by multiplying the color of light by the ambient intensity of the light and by the ambient color of the material. Next, we calculate the diffuse factor by doing a dot product between the normal vector and the light vector. This gives us the cosine of theta. There are two things to note here. First, we normalize the normal vector before the dot product. The reason is that when the rasterizer performs a vector interpolation across the triangle face, it is not guaranteed that the result will also be a unit vector. So we have to do this manually. Second, we negate the light direction per the discussion that we had in the background section. You can optimize this further by providing the reversed vector from the application code, and then you would need to do this here. I'll uh, leave this to you as homework. The dot product itself is provided by the internal GLSL function dot, so you don't need to implement it yourself. Next, we initialize the diffuse color to zero, and we check whether the diffuse factor is larger than zero. If it is, it means that the light hits the front of the triangle, so we calculate the diffuse color very similarly to the way that we've calculated the ambient color. Of course, we have to use the diffuse specific attributes of the light and the material. The addition here is that we also multiply by the diffuse factor. This will modulate the intensity based on theta. Finally, we sample the color from the texture and we multiply it by the combination of the ambient and the diffuse colors to get the final output color of the fragment shader. The last thing that we need to do is go over the changes in the main application code, and there are not many, so uh, bear with me. We have a directional light variable in the tutorial 20 class. We initialize the ambient intensity to 0.1 and the diffuse intensity to 1 
and we set the light direction uh, to point to the right. In the render callback, we call calc local direction using the world matrix. Next, we set the directional light into the lighting technique, and we already saw what this function does. Now let's run this and compare the result to the previous tutorial using only ambient lighting. Let's do one final experiment using a simple terrain model that I've created using Blender. Let's see the difference between using surface and vertex normals. First, we have vertex normals, which is what SIMP generates for us when we use AI process gen smooth the normals when loading the model. Okay, now let's change this to gen normals, which will simply generate regular normals for the triangle. And uh, as you can see, the result is indeed uh, less uh, smooth than the previous one. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next tutorial.